Well, Jay, just to make one thing clear, you may do all your skydiving for fun, but I was doing it in order to conduct personal empirical field research into the resistance characteristics of the upper air when confronted with a falling and rather large body under the influence of gravitational acceleration. <laughs> and I can report the conclusions of my research. If you throw yourself to the ground, you won't miss. <laughs> Now, um, my, my talk is actually a serious one today. It's about the nastiest consequence of the global warming scam. And the nastiest consequence is not the further enrichment of the rich, it's the further impoverishment and oppression of the poor. In traditional Christian theology, oppression of the, four, of the poor is one of the four most serious mortal sins you can commit. Those who advocate this global warming nonsense are oppressing the poor, and I'm going to add to Craig's analysis by showing you why this is the case. Now, there are the people we're talking about. These are the people of Africa. Do they look as though they have got enough of everything in that photograph? No, they don't. The first thing they don't have, of course, is electricity. Why don't they have electricity? Because instead of spending money giving them coal-fired power stations, the cheapest, most low-tech, most reliable ways of delivering uh, baseload power, we instead say they can't have the coal-fired power that we have had because that will destroy the planet, even though it is now known that it won't. Now here is the position. This is how terrible the accelerating rate of global warming is. As of a few days ago, I got the figures from remote sensing systems satellites and put them through the computer, and there has been no global warming at all, a zero least squares linear regression trend over the last 18 years and six months. Now, if you look at the predictions on the bottom panel there of the IPCC in 2005, the red arrow is the central estimate and the orange zone either side is the uncertainty range of that estimate. And then you look at the outturn below since 2005, you can see they simply don't correspond at all. Policy is being made incorrectly on the basis of predictions which have relentlessly and repeatedly, exaggeratedly failed. Policy should be made on the basis of what is observed on the data, on the results, and on the absence of global warming for very nearly two decades. Another preliminary consideration is that the West is no longer the problem and is therefore no longer part of the solution. Shutting the West down, which is the objective of the totalitarians who are driving this scare, would make virtually no difference now to the future trajectory of CO2 concentration increase. Because the emissions of China, which crossed with those of the United States and began to exceed them as recently as a decade ago, are now already double the emissions of the United States. Emissions in the United States are, rising, uh, are hardly rising at all, in fact falling, thanks to fracking and the gradual replacement of coal with gas. China, on the other hand, which continues its policy of building one or two new coal-fired power stations every week, as you can see, uh, is now already at twice the total emissions of the United States, and that will soon be three times and four times the emissions of the United States, and they're already burning, getting on for half of all the coal burned in the world. Yet Mr. Obama exempted China in December in a meeting in Peking, from making any cuts in emissions whatsoever, either before or after 2030, read the small print of that agreement. That makes a mockery of any attempt in the West to reduce carbon emissions, even if that was a problem. Now what I'm going to do is to use a much simpler method of climate economics than what you've just heard from Craig Idso. Uh, what we're going to do is to point out that hitherto the literature has tended to look at the effects of CO2 on a kind of global grand scale. What I'm trying to do in the analysis I'm going to show you now is to look at it right down to the micro scale so that you can compare the unit mitigation costs of any individual policy with any other individual policy's unit mitigation cost so as to decide which to do, but also to compare them with the cost of simply doing nothing today and waiting 
and adapting the day after tomorrow if, as and when, it becomes necessary. So the method is that we, first of all, take the... I can hardly see the slide from here, unfortunately. I haven't got a repeater screen. Um, the cost of... Can somebody read this out for me? Because I can't see it from here. Uh, That's right. We evaluate the cost of taking no action. We, we work out how much global warming we would expect to abate as a result of any CO2 mitigation policy. And then, uh, assuming that the global unit mitigation cost of uh, all policies would follow that of that policy, what would be the unit mitigation cost of that policy? What would be the global all forcings abatement cost of, of abating all projected global warming over the period of that policy? And then by how much would the policy cost more or less than inaction? These seem to me to be the sort of straightforward, narrowly focused questions that ought to have been asked in this debate and haven't. So the first question, which you've already heard Craig talking about, is that of discount to present value. Now, present value in economics is the value to us of future dollars at today's prices. And the bird in the hand rule is that a dollar today is worth more to us than a dollar in the pockets of our grandchildren a hundred years hence. Now, you may sound, think that that sounds unduly capitalistic and harsh. Let me explain why that isn't, in fact, the case. This analysis is going to show this as we go along. Now, the barking mad Stern report <laughs> of 2006 for Her Majesty's government by a socialist economist, uh, which earned him a peerage. He can sit in the House of Lords and I can't, so there is a hint of jealousy here. Um, <laughs> Uh, he, he, said, he said, in the review, we took as our base case the assumption that there was a one in ten chance that the world will come to an end in just 85 years from now, if not sooner, as a result of man-made global warming. It is only if you make an extreme assumption like that that you could even begin to make out that it's worth more to us and to future generations to do something about climate change than not to do something about it. And that was the absurd assumption on which the policies of just about all governments to mitigate rather than to adapt is ludicrously and insanely based. Now, the correct method of determining the discount rate, which Václav Klaus presented at a conference on climate in Cambridge, which I helped to organise a few years ago, is that you have to bear in mind that if you put a very low discount rate, then what you're doing is unduly favouring future generations at the expense of present generations. And if you do that enough, then you damage the capacity of present generations to leave a suitable inheritance to future generations, so you end up damaging the future generations as well. So what he argues for, and in my view correctly, is that you should use the market discount rate, which is at absolute minimum, according to the reviewed literature on this subject, 5% per annum. And as you can see, over a long period, that's going to make quite a difference to working out whether we or our successors should get the benefit. Now, what then is the cost of doing nothing? This is also quite interesting, because what um, Stern does is to say, well, supposing we get not more than three Celsius of warming this century, and I have news for you, it's going to be not more than one Celsius of warming this century, at Moncton of Brentley et al., uh, Science Bulletin, January 2015, download it now. Um, <laughs> but it's not going to be more than three Celsius, and therefore he says the cost is going to be at his discount rate, which is around 1.4%. Uh, it, it, its cost is going to be something like, uh, what does he say, 3% of GDP. And it would be higher if the um, rate of warming were higher, but it's not going to be. So 3% of GDP is where we're at. Now, what that rather complicated equation up there uh, does is it actually conflates three rather difficult equations to program into a single very elegant equation which co combines the summation, absolute, and signum functions in an ingenious way, very easy to program, so that one can convert the cost at one discount rate of a given policy immediately to the cost of another. 
And what you see is that if you change from a 1.4% to a 5% market discount rate, then that 3% of GDP cost uh, all the way through the century uh, of doing nothing falls to just 0.5% of GDP. That's, what it, that's the difference that it makes. That's all tabulated there, and you can see other discount rates. You see Ghana in Australia, you see HM Treasury's various discount rates there, and you can see what a difference it makes. But 0.5% of GDP is the cost of doing nothing if we get as much as 3 Celsius degrees of warming over the next century. Now, the likelihood of our getting 3 is negligible. So what we're really saying is there actually isn't any cost at all if we do nothing about climate change except let it happen. Now that's quite an important conclusion. You won't see this anywhere else because nobody else has done it as simply as this. Now the assumptions we make in then doing a detailed case study are, are simplifying uh, assumptions. We start by saying that we're going to exclude costs and benefits external to the policy and to mitigation of CO2 forcing. We're going to assume that GDP growth rates and welfare losses from climate inaction are going to be uniform from the period that we're looking at. We're going to assume that IPCC climatology, we hold our noses here, is normative, but only for the sake of argument, said Solum ad argumentum. Now, we have to derive a couple of quantities, which are done briefly here. We need to know what the transient climate sensitivity parameter is over the period we're looking at. It's about 0.5 Kelvin per watt per square meter. Shamefully, the IPCC doesn't state this, but you can calculate it from their tables. And likewise, we need to know what percentage of all forcings is represented by CO2. That's also done from those tables. And here is a case study from Australia. And what it shows is that if you were to carry out Australia's carbon tax policy, which the previous government tried to introduce in 2010, then uh, the fraction of global emissions uh, abated over the 10-year lifetime of the policy from 2011 to 2020 would be 0 0.006. Now that is so small a fraction it's not going to make very much difference to anything. And as you can see, it's going to cost you $130 billion in order to get there. So what are the results, then, if you put those figures into the model? Well, what you get is that that would forestall, it would forestall warming at a rate. You'd, you'd actually prevent warming of 0 0.000085 Kelvin. Nobody else has ever costed any individual policy to find out how much global warming that policy would forestall. Now you can see why they don't do it because that's how little warming you forestall. And then you want to know is, what is the mitigation, unit mitigation cost per Kelvin of warming forestalled by policies of equivalent cost effectiveness? And the answer is of, at an entirely affordable 1.5 quadrillion per Kelvin of warming forestalled. Fred Singer is going to write me a check for that amount imminently. So the global all-warming abatement cost of abating the one-sixth of a Celsius of warming that should be happening in this decade, and so far I can inform you that the rate of warming over this decade is 0, 0.0, uh, is going to be, I can't read again, it's 300 and something trillion. In, th thank you. It's $45,500 per head of the global population. Craig Idso is already reaching for his checkbook or his hat, I'm not sure which. And, and then... We have also, it's, it's very nearly three-fifths of global GDP, and all of that would just forestall one-sixth of a Celsius degree of global warming. Now, in all of this, uh, we need to know what is the action-inaction ratio, or the benefit-cost ratio. And here you see that the cost of action, in this case, uh, getting on for 60% of GDP, Cost of doing nothing, we did the discount earlier, it's 0.5% of GDP. It's 110 times more expensive to mitigate global warming today using policies of uh, equivalent uh, unit mitigation cost worldwide to the Australian carbon tax scheme, which is one I use because they actually tried to do it. We've got real figures for it. It's 100 times more expensive to mitigate today than to adapt the day after tomorrow.
Now, on, this, on any analysis like this, it is absolutely clear it's not worth doing anything about global warming. There you have it again at all the discount rates. Even if you use Stern's ridiculously low discount rate based on the idea that the whole world's going to go poof by 2100, it's still 20 times costlier to act today than, than tomorrow. Garneau's own rate it, for, the, for Australia, 40 times more expensive. Treasury, 50 or 60 times more expensive. The market discount rate, 110 times more expensive. Re Reinforcing Craig's point about the relevance of the discount rate. So we therefore summarise the results there of this Australia's carbon tax. And you can do this very simply for any proposed mitigation strategy. I did the same thing for Sa Sanders Boxer. That was even more hilarious. Now the economic conclusions then are very straightforward. Mitigation will actually, first of all, be costlier than the metric I've just shown you indicates. Because we've made various impossible assumptions there. And if the CO2 residence time is really as long as the IPCC thinks, you're not going to get any benefits whatsoever from CO2 mitigation within this century. And so no policy to abate global warming by taxing, trading, regulating, reducing or replacing greenhouse gas emissions will prove cost effective solely on grounds of the welfare benefit from climate mitigation. CO2 mitigation strategies that are inexpensive enough to be affordable will be ineffective. Strategies costly enough to be effective will be unaffordable. Focused adaptation is better because then what you've got is all that money you would have spent on global warming, you can spend on giving people electricity that haven't got it. And here is the summary that anyone doing a responsible and proper analysis, an intertemporal, intertemporal uh, investment appraisal, where you combine those techniques in economics with the IPCC's own equations in the way that we've done here, the cost of the premium exceeds the cost of the risk insured, so don't insure. What do you do with the money instead? There is the dark continent, that is Africa. As you can see, apart from South Africa and the river ribbon of light down the Nile in Egypt, they use, in that entire heavily populated continent, only as much electricity per hour as the small outback town in Australia of Dubbo, New South Wales. <laughs> can you imagine how dreadful that is? No light to read by at night. No refrigeration. Nothing to help you out and give you the chance of prosperity, the chance, therefore, to lift yourself out of overpopulation and therefore reduce the impact on humanity, of, of humanity on the planet. Here is King Canute. You've seen the shadow of this image behind all the previous slides. He, in 1032 AD, was a Danish king of England who once took his courtiers down to the seaside and said, I'm going to stop the sea coming in. And he held out his hand, I'm going to stop sea level rise. A bit like Obama said when he came in. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what sea level did? It didn't do what, uh, what it's doing under Obama, which it isn't rising. It actually came in and wet the royal feet. And the courtiers said, as the king finally flipped and gone mad. So he turned round to them, and it's all in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. He said this, Verily, my flatterers, we hold not so much power as ye believe. Mind ye well then that reigneth one only king, he that is almighty, he that governeth the sea and holdeth the ocean in the hollow of his hand. Keep ye then your praises unto him alone. Thank you. <laughs>